Hello and welcome to Motor Week. Here's what's coming up on this week's show. Richard Hammond gets to grips with the latest SUV to hit the streets, the all-new Jeep Cherokee. Chris Goffey negotiates the twists and bends of the Isle of Man and the all-new Honda Civic Type R. And Glenda McKay looks at the rebirth of Fiat's legendary R-Bath mark. So there they were, the good old boys at Jeep, churning out rusty, tufty, no-nonsense off-roaders, just as they have done for 60 years. And then, all of a sudden, they turn around and the whole world has gone mad. All of which means Jeep needed a very, very different new Cherokee. The market has changed completely. Nobody chews on Marlboro wearing a Stetson and stamping through the desert in a big chunky off-roader. We've invented the soft roader. Whilst Jeep were practicing rugby, everybody else was taking ballet lessons. We all know the figures, they're quoted often enough. 98% of 4x4 owners will never take their car off-road. But in the case of Jeep, it is slightly different because you're buying into a brand. If you buy a Ferrari, you're probably not going to drive everywhere at 180 miles an hour, but you want to be damn sure that you could. On the road, it certainly doesn't feel like a soft rotor. It doesn't have that light and delicate touch to it. You feel like you're in something pretty substantial, but it's maybe not as cumbersome and clumpy as the old Cherokee could be. So Jeep had to think very carefully about how far they went down the pretty road. Sure, it's got to look good, but it's also got to perform on and off road. As with the old Cherokee, you get a choice of two different versions. Basically, you've got your city slicker in the limited edition, and then you've got your roughy tufty good old boy in the form of the sport. Take your pick, really. The essential differences boil down to cosmetic details, body-coloured panels here and there, but it's more to do with the ethos of the car. The limited edition feels posh, more at home on the school run. Whereas out in rural areas, you're more likely to find the sport making itself at home in the mud. There's actually more space in this new model, even in the boot, particularly now the spare wheel on the tailgate, not taking up all your shopping space. Now here is something handy if you want to impress in the supermarket car park. <laughs> oh, very nifty. Right then, let's give this thing a go. Well, Jeep have promised us an opportunity to discover just what the new Cherokee can do off-road. And I imagine it's going to be something more than just a walk in the park. This might hurt. OK, so Jeep would hardly send us round a course in a car that couldn't cope with it. But this thing is seriously tough. It has completed the legendary Rubicon Trail and survived that. So I guess this, to it, is nothing. To me, though, it's a challenge.
They may be readjusting slightly to meet the new soft roader bias in the market, but this is still very much a proper off-roader. This will cope with things that you can't. This will cope with things that your body can't. Well, we have been warned that whatever lies over there is very tough. I've just watched the car in front. I don't want to do that. That doesn't look natural. And it doesn't look safe. But I'm going to be great. <laughs> this is madness! You can't do this in a car! Why, what are you going to do to me? What happens down there? That is tremendous! Absolutely phenomenal! That was without a doubt, that was the toughest off road I've ever bloody done. You know, I think next time I shall bring something with an outboard. No Jeep made amphibious vehicles. <laughs> In all honesty. Now, typically, Jeep aren't exactly being all mincing and coy about talking about the opposition. They're talking about Freelander. They're taking it on head to head. And if you spec it up to the same level of kit, this would cost less than the equivalent Freelander. Food for thought. I don't think they'll have any trouble shifting these. Today I'm going to be test driving our bath and what a beautiful bath it is as well. I've got many fond memories of luxuriating amongst the bubbles with the candles on, the music in the background and... Uh, look, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I, I might be blonde and a bit thick but why are we test driving our bath? Uh, Glenda, you know, you're test driving the new Fiat Punto our bath. The new Fiat Punto what? Our bath. It's sitting on the driveway. It was dropped off yesterday. Well, I've not seen any punter on my driveway. The black one. Oh. Oh, that fear. <laughs> uh, sorry, lads. Uh, can you give me five minutes? Sorry. <sighs> so, this is the new Fiat Punto Our Bath. It's Italian, it's stylish, it's sporty, and I've heard that it's really quite fast. But is it just mutton dressed up as lamb? Or is it something really rather special? Shall we find out? The first thing that strikes you about this Punto is its body kit. Those 15-inch alloy wheels lead up to the specially designed side skirts and front and rear spoilers, leaving the Abarth looking great. This Punto is easily the craziest looking small car on the market, giving even the Fiesta ZTEC S styling a run for its money. The interior isn't bad either, it continues in the sporty theme. We've got these rather smart gear stick and handbrake in chrome, and we've got a special R bar steering wheel, plus sporty aluminium pedals. And I was really surprised to learn that as standard, you get a six disc CD changer, plus satellite navigation. That, plus the fact that you can sit five people in here very comfortably, I reckon that the Punto R bar is really quite a nice place to be. The overall ride is let down by the Punto's ability to pick up every bump in the road. This is fun for the first few minutes, but trust me, the novelty soon wears off. 
And considering how hard the suspension is, I was disappointed with the car's cornering ability. And added to that, you need legs longer than Naomi Campbell's to impress the clutch. All Puntos come with dual drive electric power steering and what this basically means is that you can select the setting that you want for your steering. Mode 1 is for city drive and this basically reduces the amount of effort you've got to put in into turning the wheel. So ladies, no more nightmare parking scenarios. And Mode 2 is for the country and it gives you more feedback through the steering wheel when you're out on the open roads. And I tell you what, you can really feel the difference and I don't think it's going to be long before you see other manufacturers putting this system into their cars. Perhaps this car is somehow connected to horoscopes because it's just covered with little scorpions. So unless you're born between October the 23rd and November the 22nd, maybe this isn't the car for you. With a price tag of £13,395, the Punto R Bath isn't cheap. But then I have been really impressed with the build quality of this car, both inside and out. From the steering wheel right down to the finish on the body kit, it's solid. And it's going to take a heck of a lot of knocking about to make this car fall to pieces. But it's under the bonnet that disappoints. The R Bath uses the same 1.8 litre, 130 brake horsepower engine found in the HGT Punto, which is a very good engine indeed, don't get me wrong. It's just a shame an engine hasn't been developed especially for the Abarth, giving it the extra power that the body kit asks for. But with a 0-60 time of 8.6 seconds and a top speed of 127 miles an hour, the Abarth certainly ain't slow. So that was the Fiat Punto R-Bath and after a long day's test driving, there's nothing I like better than getting in R-Bath and that's exactly what I'm going to do. Uh, you can go now lads. You're not filming this bit, you're not paying me enough, go on. Well, that's it for part one, but after the break, we put the new Honda Civic Type R through its paces on the Isle of Man. The superbly beautiful background of the centre of the Isle of Man. Spiritually, a very important place for Honda of Japan because old Mr. Honda came to this island in the 1940s to watch motorcycle racing and he decided from his garage in his back garden he could build a motorcycle to take on the rest of the world and the rest as we know is history. Well today Honda have come back to the Isle of Man for the launch of this car, the new Civic Type R. A very important car for Honda because it's the first one they get to build in their factory in England at Swindon that's going to be on sale in Japan. This is the new Civic in three-door form. It's been stiffened, lowered, huge 17-inch wheels with 7J rims, big fat tyres, huge ventilated disc brakes as you'd expect. But the heart of the new Civic Type R is as always the engine. 2 litres, 200 brake horsepower, intelligent variable valve timing and that's enough to take it to a maximum of almost 150 miles an hour and 0 to 60 in around 6.5 seconds. A seriously quick little car. First impressions when you set off are these rally style seats that really do hug you around the shoulders and the hips and hold you firm in spirited cornering. Nice instrument layout, nice clear instruments, a rev counter red lined at 8000 rpm which is encouraging. Of course that's always been one of the great strengths of these Honda engines that you can drive the car very slowly, you can drive it smoothly, uh, you can drive it in a high gear and it'll pull from quite low revs and it really doesn't reveal its true character until the revs climb up to around the four and a half thousand mark and then things start happening. As you'd expect with these ultra low profile tyres the low speed ride is quite lumpy and the car is disturbed by potholes and road imperfections but as soon as the pace picks up the Civic is beautifully poised on the road. It's 
super steering, it's perfectly weighted. The car responds instantaneously to any input and you can place it to the inch on the road. And that wailing engine note, as it goes between seven and 8,000 revs, just intoxicating. The engine wails away at 7,000, 8,000 revs. The big, fat, sticky tyres just grip and grip. And these huge ventilated discs with ABS really work. An open road on the Isle of Man mountain. What more could you ask for? It's no surprise that Honda are applying for full FIA Group N homologation for this car for a racing series in 2002. And they say it'll need remarkably few modifications to turn it into a racer. As a road car, it makes a great deal of sense. £16,000 is not expensive when you look at the tremendous performance. It comes in any colour you like, as long as it's red, black or silver. And for someone who wants a practical, reliable, everyday transport, that won't disgrace you on a track day, look no further. In 1997, when Mercedes were about to launch their latest model, all the signs were good. Experts predicted it would be a future car of the year. Early test drives were positive, and it was to be the first truly mass-produced Mercedes-Benz. But then, it all went wrong. A team of Swedish testers took the A-Class to a circuit and put it through what they call the Elk Test, a high-speed slalom. The A-Class tipped over and production of the car was halted. Now, it took months before the A-Class was relaunched with modifications that kept the car stable, but some damage had been done. Well, the A-Class has been around for some time now, so we thought it was worth a look as a used car buy. Supplies initially took a while to come through, but there are plenty of examples out there on the market, either from main dealers, car superstores, or in the private sales. Mercedes have sold well over 20,000 A-Classes in this country, and they're a familiar sight on our roads. There's no doubting the brilliant packaging on the A-Class. It has the space of a Golf or a Focus, but it's smaller than a Ford car. The boot's not huge, there's good room in the rear for passengers and the seats remove fairly easily. There are also front and side airbags, but all-round build quality is perhaps not what you'd expect on a Mercedes-Benz. I've always really liked the A-Class and if you're thinking of buying a used one, remember there are lots about, so haggle hard to get a good deal too expensive, walk away and go to another dealer. Always look for a car that's got full service history, or you could look out for one of the former fleet or higher cars which might have about 25,000 miles on the clock, but could be snapped up for as little as eight and a half thousand pounds. The A-Class is quiet, easy to drive and handles well for what is a tall car. Now, if you're fed up with city driving and don't want a full automatic model, well, you could look out for Mercedes Auto Clutch System, which uses a conventional five-speed gearbox, but without the clutch. And it's a system that actually works quite well. Now, when the A-Class was first launched, it had few rivals. Now, it's got lots. There's the Scenic, the Picasso, the Safira, and Audi's A2. If a badge like this is important to you, then the A-Class is a good buy, albeit a rather expensive one. That's this week's used car tip, the Mercedes-Benz A-Class.
here on Motor Week, we promote the freedom and fun that cars give us. But of course, there are many people who feel that car and associated manufacturers should really address the environmental problems that cars cause. Well, they're getting there bit by bit. This may look like an ordinary tyre, but it's actually the world's first which uses extracts of corn. No, it's not April the 1st. The new Goodyear GT3 BioTread tyre actually uses the corn extract as a polymer filler. Like to learn more? Here comes the science bit. Tyre tread rubber is a mixture of different elements, mostly rubber polymers and reinforcing filler to give it strength. Well, traditionally, the filler was carbon black produced by burning oil. Recently, silica was introduced for lower rolling resistance and better wet grip. But now, not only does this corn extract replace a nasty oil burning process, but the resultant tyres, say Goodyear, give far better performance results than traditional ones. The new tyres are lighter and offer a further reduction in rolling resistance, which should save up to 5% in fuel consumption and 30% reduction in noise. Plus, the greener manufacturing techniques will save in CO2 emissions. Of course, there are still the environmental problems involved with tyre disposal, but with breakthroughs like this, motoring is getting a little more environmentally friendly, so we can all feel a little less guilty about it. That's all for this week's Motor Week. Make sure you catch us next week when we have a practical load lugging test for the Rover 75 Tourer. See you soon.